Again, we want to welcome all the students back. And it's, a, it's a bit crowded this morning. Um, maybe turn me down a little bit there, Ryan. Thank you. But we're delighted to see all of y'all back. Um, and as we fill up, it's, we always, as a church, try to resist the need to go to, to multiple services for a number of reasons. That's one reason we, why we planted a church in Christiansburg a couple of years back, so that we sent out about 80 members that are now worshiping right now. They're over there in Christiansburg listening to Pastor Waters preach. Uh, so this year, what we have done, you may have noticed a flat screen in the foyer. Uh, and so what that is trying to communicate to you is as we fill up and you maybe feel a little crowded, keep inviting friends. We'll make it work. We can stuff people in the foyer if need be. But the parent is a beautiful screen, a beautiful picture, which means I, I actually have to shave every Sunday morning. <laughs> Uh, and if that fills up, then we'll move close to the fellowship hall. The point is, is we do want to see God's kingdom grow, uh, and yet do so in such a way that we remain one worshiping congregation uh, as we are able, and also pray for the other biblical churches around town, and pray for God to prosper them as well. Now, uh, as we uh, come to God's word this morning, I want to first of all thank Pastor Rollo for manning the pulpit uh, and the pastor this summer as I was on break for much of the summer uh, from what I hear. He did an excellent job, so thank you, Taylor. And now we are in the middle, or really the second week, of a short series on the seven penitential psalms, or as I'm calling them in more modern language, in case you don't know what the word penitential means, seven psalms of repentance. Repentance is just a word which means to turn away from your sin and, and mess and turn back towards God. It's something that Christians need uh, every day of their life. As Martin Luther said at the beginning of the Reformation, that the Christian life is a life of repentance. We never outgrow that. Uh, and we began a couple weeks ago in Psalm 6, which you can go back and listen to on the website if you care to. And this morning we're in Psalm 32, which is uh, one of the most important psalms, I, I would say. It was at least uh, reportedly Augustine's favorite. He had it posted over his head on his deathbed. And you may have noticed in the worship service, we've already looked at it really three times already, and we're going to sing it at the end. So if nothing else from this service this morning, I hope you get to know Psalm 32 really well. Now, for those of you that were with us last year, and we're looking forward to getting back into 1 Corinthians, uh, we're going to do that. But where we were is we are just about to begin chapter 7, which is right off the bat all about sex and marriage and divorce. And I thought maybe we should wait a few weeks before we jump into that as we begin a new school year. If you're anxious to get there, feel free to, to read ahead. Um, we are going to get there, but we're just going to spend a few weeks on these psalms of repentance. Then we're going to take a break, get back to Corinthians, and then we're going to return to these bit by bit, uh, finishing up all seven. We're going to come to them each Lord's Day. Uh, I mean, sorry, each uh, Lord's Supper Sunday. Uh, and so going through this time of repentance. And so what I want us to do is to begin this school year in a season of repentance. Uh, to not just go through the rituals and uh, just do church and just do the Christian life, but really focus on these seven psalms the Lord has given us to remind us of what it means to turn away from our sin back towards God and all of his love and forgiveness. Can you think of a better way to start a new school year? Let's pray together before we start. Our God and Father, thank you for this psalm, and we pray as we look at it that you would um, bless it to our use, that you would instruct us from it, that as Don has already spoken, that you would use it to draw us once more to the gospel of grace. We pray these things in the name of our Savior Jesus. One of my uh, favorite memories comes from when I was a college student, and I took a train trip uh, up to Montreal, Canada, uh, and then back. And on the return trip on one of these you know, long Amtrak passenger cars, there are these two Scottish ladies sitting up towards the front. And apparently, one of them said something to the other that caused her to begin to chuckle a little bit. And then that chuckle kind of became a laugh, and that laugh became this huge belly-aching laugh that filled the car. And our friend also then started to laugh, and then 
right after that, the row behind her just started to laugh, and then it just kind of spread like a like a gangrene. I mean, we weren't. The thing is, is we weren't laughing with her, because we had no idea what was funny. We were laughing kind of at her. We couldn't help it. And there was this car, literally of a hundred people, just just laughing our heart, our heads off about something we didn't even know what it was. Um, and then that the, the woman who was laughing so hard started it all and caused us all to do this, then went into the, the coupling, I guess, the, the space between the passenger cars to try to get her composure. You can kind of hear her hyperventilating in there, trying to get herself together. And then finally she comes back in, and she takes one look at her friend, and then starts all over. It was just a disaster. Uh, she does it, so finally we're still laughing for like literally another five minutes and the conductors are going back and forth wondering what's on, whether they should call Homeland Security or whatever. <laughs> it was one of those days, but um, she went back between cars and then she came, I'll never forget this, she came back in and she kind of averted her eyes and she just said in her Scottish accent, don't be a look at me. Don't look at me. <laughs> I don't think it was, she, she just kind of held her head so she wouldn't start up again. I want you to think about one of the happiest times of your life. And, and maybe not just a silly time like that where we were laughing for who knows why, but really just a, a happy time when you were just filled with joy and gladness. And now I want you to think of, of one of the saddest times of your life where you were just heartbroken. And now I want you to think about this question. In general, are Christians supposed to be happier or sadder than those around us? Are we who, who really understand and believe the gospel, are we supposed to, uh, to be more mournful or are we supposed to be more joyful than the people around us? Well, what do you think? Now, look down to verse 10 uh, of our psalm, Psalm 32. David says, many are the sorrows of the wicked... But steadfast love surrounds the one who trusts in the Lord. Now, is that, is that ring true for you? That unbelievers are sorrowful, but you feel surrounded by God's steadfast love. But look, if that is true for you on a, on a normal basis, well, praise God. That means you're living by faith. You understand the gospel in an experiential way. But if there are days where this does not seem true to you, then you fit right into the Psalms. Because many of the psalms were written at a, at a time when the author did not really actually experience this. First, it's just Psalm 73. Let me read a first, the first few verses of that. Truly God is good to Israel, to those who are pure in heart. But as for me, my feet had almost stumbled. My steps had nearly slipped. And there's a wonderful RUF tune to this as well. For I was envious of the arrogant when I saw the prosperity of the wicked, for they have no pangs until death. Their bodies are fat and sleek. But back then it was good to, to be fat. They, they're full of food. They are not in trouble as others are. They are not stricken like the rest of mankind. So to Psalm 73, it appears to be the exact opposite, that the wicked are happy, and the righteous are the ones who are suffering. And then look back to our psalm in verse 3 and 4. David's talking about rejoicing, but look, when I kept silent, my bones wasted away. Through my groaning all day long. For day and night your hand was heavy upon me. My strength was dried up as by the heat of summer. So David doesn't seem very happy in these verses, does he? So which is it? Are believers supposed to be happier than those around us? Or sad? Or is it a bit of both? Now, we know this is a psalm of David for two reasons. First of all, there's the title. Uh, we read at the very beginning, a masculine of David. Now, not everyone agrees that these titles of these psalms are inspired by the Holy Spirit. Some think they are added shortly and afterwards by commentators. Uh, we read that as a masculine. We don't know what that means. It's probably a musical instruction of, of some kind. Um, as I mentioned last time, we're, we're going to sing this later in the service. I'm sure we'll do it just like David wanted us to. Um, but at least... Early on in Israel's history, David was described as the author. But we know this, but more importantly, we know David's the author. Because in Romans 4, which Taylor read for us, Paul says so. Paul says David wrote this. Which is a very good argument that these titles then really are actually part of the Word of God. Now, when he wrote this is unclear. Uh, many scholars believe David wrote this towards the end of his life as he's recounting his many sins. And the 
you know David's life, those sins included adultery and murder and all sorts of horrible things. You can read about it in, in 2 Samuel. But what matters is not what David has done, but where he ends up. So as we turn to this psalm, we'll look at it in four sections as we have time. Now this is not arbitrary on my part. Uh, 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 um, Faith has already pointed out these little ascriptions, Salah, here in the margins. Again, scholars are not sure whether those are part of the inspired word or added on as early commentary, but clearly whoever added those in knew how the psalm was to be sung. And so there are these four different sections where there's either this pause, or some people actually uh, think that it's not just a pause. Some people think that this is actually uh, a crescendo, that David is saying, here's what you're saying really loudly. Like, think about Enter enter the Sandman at the beginning of a football game, right? That's what David's saying. It's really, this is what I want you to focus on. But most think it's probably a pause between verses. Either way, they provide an early commentary on how the psalm is to be divided up. So the first section is verses 1 through 4, which we'll spend most of our time on this morning. The second, then, is just verse 5. You see that? Another Salah. And then 6 and 7 is the third section, and finally the last section is verse 8 to the end. So we'll take this section by section and try to see, then, whether we ought to be the saddest folks around or the happiest folks around. Let's begin, then, uh, in verse 1 and 2. Blessed is the one whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. Blessed is the man against whom the Lord counts no iniquity, uh, uh, and in whose spirit there is no deceit. Now these two psalms then serve as a summary or a heading for the entire psalm. They, they set the tone, which is why some scholars say this is really more of a thanksgiving than a, a psalm of repentance. It doesn't matter. It's the word of God. David wrote it. Uh, and, 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 and they all kind of fit together. The, both both uh, repentance and rejoicing fit together. That's what I hope us to see. I want us to see. So he says, blessed is the one whose transgression is forgiven. Now, that word blessed here in the Hebrew could just as easily be translated as happy, which gets to our question. Happy is the one whose sin is forgiven. You, you want to be happy in life? Is that, is that what you think the goal of life is? Am I arguing with that? But if you want to be happy in life, what you need first and foremost is to know that your sins are forgiven by your maker. That, that you're right with God, that no matter what you go through in this world, and it's going to be a hard life if you haven't been told that already. The scriptures promise you that. No matter what you go through, in the end, you're going to be all right. That's what the psalm is about. How to be truly happy. In the end, and down deep. Uh, secondly, uh, a, a note about the vocabulary is that David uses a very unusual construction there in that first verse, where he says, blessed is the one. See that? But then in verse 2, he says, blessed is the man. There's a difference here. Now, it's not a difference of gender, as you... I'm sure no. when the Bible uses the word man, very often it refers to both men and women together. But this first verse, so, to, so there in verse 2 then, David's saying, uh, that's individually, blessed are you uh, if, if, if the Lord does not count your iniquity against you. But in verse 1, I think what David is getting at is that this forgiveness is available to anyone. Anyone. It's not just about David. It's not just his personal story. This is a free offer of God's grace and forgiveness to anyone who hears the good news and believes it. So nobody here this morning, no matter what you have done, should think that you're, you're outside of the offer of God's grace. If you hear the promises of this psalm this morning and believe them, you too will be happy. You too will be blessed. So now let's look at the vocabulary uh, David uses to describe his sin. And you may have noticed that he uses three different words. Transgression, and then the word translated just as sin. And then the third word is iniquity. Now there's um, a little bit of nuance between these. Uh, transgression generally means to violate a known rule, like to trespass, right? Forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Sometimes we call those sins of commission, things that you do, you know you shouldn't do. The second word as sin is, is more of the idea of um, failing to reach the mark of God's righteousness. Maybe you don't think you're that bad a person, that you have not committed that many sins. Well, what you need to hear then this morning is God's perfect standard of righteousness. It's not just enough that you don't actively violate his commands, although you do, whether you know it or not, but that you don't live up to the righteousness that he demands in order for you to live with him forever. 
God loves you too much for you not to be perfect. And so this sin is a sin of omission, the things that you fail to do to love God with all your heart, soul, and strength. And then finally, this word iniquity is, is more about the consequence of sin in us, what it does to our souls, the guilt and the ugliness uh, that, that we bear because of our sins, more about who we are than what we do. But the point is this, we all, this morning, have all three of these in our lives. All three describe each of us. We each stand guilty before God if left to ourselves. We break God's law, we fall short of his glory, and apart from Christ, our hearts are, are desperately wicked. Um, as Augustine, I mentioned that he had this psalm put over his, his deathbed. And the phrase that he developed from this psalm, which became well known, was the beginning of knowledge. If you want to be wise, the beginning of knowledge is to know thyself to be a sinner. That's where you start. Is to know that you need Christ. You know you need the, that you need a Savior. You know you are a sinner. That's something the world will not tell you. That's something you only hear from the Scriptures and from those who preach the gospel of grace. You need to know you're a sinner. So, here's the question then. What happens when we don't acknowledge that? What if, even, even as a believer, you try to ignore the fact that you keep breaking God's laws and that you, by all rights, deserve an eternity in hell? What, what happens when you're, you're not really dealing business with God? Well, David tells us in verses 3 and 4. Listen, listen to what he says. For when I kept silent, right? We read this already. My bones wasted away. I groaned all day long. He says he's keeping silent, but then he's groaning. So which is it? Well, he's keeping silent. He's not talking to God. He's not talking to God about it, and that's telling him to groan. Maybe he's looking for peace and quiet, but he's not getting it. In fact, he's groaning instead because he's not talking to God. And then day and night, it wasn't just a momentary pang of conscience. Day and night, God's hand was heavy upon him. His strength was dried up by the heat of summer. Now, remember, David's writing this as a believer. He knows that he's going to live forever with God. But in David's walk with God, he was covering up his sin, or tried to cover up his sin. Now, obviously, we really can't hide our sin from God, can we? I mean, that's silly. I, um, I used to babysit a lot when I was a teenager. And I remember this one little kid I used to babysit that I would sometimes have to supervise his dinner uh, for. And he didn't really like to eat very much. And so I remember we'd go into the TV room and he'd have his dinner on these little paper plates, and, and I'd turn around, and then I'd turn right back around, and the food was gone, like he'd eaten it. <laughs> like just in the sun. And, and I remember one time, uh, he had taken his roll and his butter and his salad, and he hid it behind the TV case. Now, this is, this is back before, you know, flat screens. This was a big old entertainment center, those big old TVs that you can't even give away anymore, right? And he had hidden this, this whole dinner back then. I remember digging the butter out of my hands with all the wires. He thought he was hiding his sin from me, but no. <laughs> so the same thing with us. We think we are getting away with things, but we're not. God sees them, and he's the one that matters. So have you ever experience this feeling David's felt in verses 3 and 4, where you know you're doing something wrong, but you just refuse to talk to God about it, or you did something wrong, and you still just, just are just kind of covering it up and hoping it's going to go away? Well, look, if you are a believer in Christ, then you are going to experience this. It's a gift from God. Look, suppose that you have a conflict um, with somebody that's lasted years, or a conflict from many years, somebody in your family, and you never resolve it. And so you just kind of sit on it year after year, and you just let it fester. And you might have relative peace because you're not fighting all the time, but it's not a fully healthy relationship because you have things stuffed down. And so finally, when it when it all comes out, it's kind of lousy, right? It just you're, you're, it's just terrible. I mean, I'm sure David did not enjoy writing these verses. But at least then, you're really communicating together about real things. 
And even though it's sad and difficult, the healing in the relationship can begin because you're you're you're, you're becoming, if you will, even though you're, you're dealing with all the, the garbage, you're becoming more fully human. You're experiencing the full range of emotion that you should in dealing with your sin and your relationship with God. That's why the Psalms are so helpful to us, is they help us see, you know, I ask the question, are you supposed to be sadder or happier? Well, maybe it's both, right? And that's what the Psalms show us. In, uh, the, are we supposed to be sadder than those around us? Well, the answer is yes about some things. We are sadder than unbelievers in some sense because we know the full depth of our sin and how we have uh, disappointed God. We know His perfect standard and that we fail to meet it. And this, my friends, this is a gift from God that unbelievers don't get. You know, look again at verse 4. For day and night your hand was heavy upon me. This was something God was doing. This wasn't just David's guilty conscience. The Holy Spirit was convicting David of his sin and the fact that he wasn't being honest about it. I had a, uh, a friend, a good friend of mine, who lives in another state, someone you all don't know. And uh, he used to have to travel on business a lot. And as he traveled to, to various locations and stayed in hotels, he would sometimes watch things on the television that he couldn't. I'm sure that's something many of us can relate to. And the thing is, you have to understand, he could get away with this. Nobody would know, except that he said that every time he did this, it was like a nuclear bomb going off in his soul. That he was just in turmoil. He was all torn up inside and depressed for days afterwards. Why? He could have gotten away with it. An unbeliever would have done that and it wouldn't have bothered them at all. Why? Because my friend had the Holy Spirit within him. He had the principle of holiness within him, so that when you stray from God and you actively rebel, you are inviting warfare, right? And that's a good thing. That's a gift from God. You're not like the wicked who slip and slide into hell, their conscience is unbothered. Oh, no. God's hand comes heavy upon you, that you might lower yourself before him, and then he raised you up. And so if you ever feel experience this because of your sin, not don't look, I hope you don't experience this because of someone else's sin, right? You need to, to deal with your own first. Well, if you do that, that means you're a normal Christian. That's the evidence that God Himself lives within you and He's calling you upward that, and He's fitting you for heaven. And that you're going to live with Him forever. You're supposed to have this conflict with sin. So the question then is this: what do we do with that war? If our sin has made us sad and depressed and, and, and burdened, what do we then do with that? And that's what David does next in verse 5 as we turn to this next section. Something we all have to do. He says, I acknowledged my sin to you. I did not cover my iniquity. I said I will confess my transgressions to the Lord. And you forgave the iniquity of my sin. You see, this is the turning point of the psalm. You see how David uses all three words again for sin, and he does three things with those with those sins. Uh, first of all, he acknowledges them. He admits it. Secondly, he doesn't try to cover them up anymore. And then thirdly, he confesses. He talks to God about them. He says, I am a sinner. Maybe there's a process here. I don't know. The point is, is that it's all part of the same movement away from your rebellion and back towards God and His grace. <clears throat> so, when, when David does this in verse 5, how certain is he of God's forgiveness? He says, and you forgave the iniquity of my sin. There's, there's no question about it at all. Remember, by this point, David had likely already committed adultery and murder. And yet he knows that God has forgiven him. Why? What basis? Why does David know that God has forgiven him? Did David know that somehow he had done enough good works to make up for his bad deeds, that he balanced out the ledger? Well, this is where we let the Bible interpret the Bible. This is where we let Romans 4 interpret this for us. And I actually want to turn there. Now, we do this very rarely if you're new with us, the more you flip through the Bible. But this is important how I want you to turn to Romans 4. Look at, if you have your few Bibles, it's page 941. 
Now to put it in context, in Romans 3, Paul had just made the point that we have all sinned and fall short of the glory of God. So how can we then be saved if we have to be perfect to live forever? How can we be justified, which means to be declared righteous or just by God? Paul tells us in Romans 3, 24, we are justified by God's grace as a gift to us. How? Through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God put forward as a propitiation by his blood to be received by faith. What that is saying is that Jesus' death on the cross served as a substitute for the death we deserved. It paid the, the penalty that we owe God. And so therefore, since we cannot earn our way to God, what we can do then is cling to Christ by faith, knowing that he gets the wrath that we deserve, and then we get the righteousness which he earned. And then God then looks at us, and he sees Christ in our place, and he declares us perfect. He declares us just. He declares us righteous as if we had never sinned. And therefore, because we had never sinned, we will live forever. We have eternal life. Death has been defeated in us. The curse of sin has been defeated in us. And if you are in Christ, that already exists for you. You're already there. You're already lifted up in Christ. And you get all that simply by confessing your sin and placing your faith in Jesus Christ. And not by anything you do. So then, getting to Romans 4, Paul's making an argument with his Jewish brothers and sisters. Because they want to then turn to the Old Testament and say, oh, well, if this is true, is it true in all of the scriptures? So Paul then uses two main Old Testament characters to prove this doctrine. And he begins with Abraham, the father of their faith. He says, what shall we say was gained by Abraham, our forefather, according to the flesh? For if Abraham was justified by works, he has something to boast about, but not before God. But what does the scripture say? Abraham believed God and it was counted to him as righteousness. In other words, before Abraham had done a thing, God promised to bless him. Abraham believed that promise, and that was reckoned to him as if he was righteous. He had not, not done a thing to earn God's favor. And then Paul goes on to explain that more in verses 4 and 5. He says, now to the one who works, like if you're earning God's favor, whether your wages are not counted as a gift, but as his due. It's impossible to earn God's favor. But to the one who does not work, that's us, but to the one who does not work, but believes in him who justifies the ungodly, his faith is counted as righteousness. So once you admit that you can never earn God's favor, you just give up and say, I can't do it. What I need is for you to save me by the merits of Jesus Christ then you are saved. You are justified. This is what we call being saved by faith alone. But then the Jews might ask the question, okay, okay we understand why Abraham, the father of our faith, was saved by faith alone. But what about David? That great sinner, that great murderer and adulterer. The one who let the kingdom down at the moment of his triumph. Surely, he had to make up for his sin. He was already in your grace. Then he loses it, they might say. So surely he has to earn his way back in, right? And that's where Paul then quotes this psalm to prove, no, that's not the case. Jesus came for sinners just like David. And so he quotes this psalm, verse 6 of Romans 4, just as David also speaks of the blessing of the one to whom God counts righteousness apart from works. Blessed are those whose lawless deeds are forgiven and whose sins are covered. Blessed is the man against whom the Lord will not count his sin. And so what Paul is telling us is that this whole psalm is about salvation by faith alone. That coming to God with nothing to offer except your own need of grace. With nothing to confess except your own sin. Coming humbly before him. Admitting your need, and then knowing that you have believed the good news, knowing that God has, had, he has lowered you, he has humbled you, he has convicted you,
but that you believe the good news, and that therefore you will be saved. And then all the blessings of Psalm 32 are ours as you return there. Look back there to verse 1 and 2. Look what happens to those three kinds of sin that David confessed. Your transgressions are forgiven. Are the Hebrew? This means literally taken away, lifted away. The sins are covered up so that they can't be seen. And iniquity is not counted against us. Now this is all, these all kind of amount to the same thing. It's not like God's going to cover up your sin but then not forgive you. Or They all go together, right? So just pick the metaphor which, which I think most comforts you. Maybe you come this morning um, feeling burdened by your sin, that it's, it's weighing you down. I mean, you, you're getting ready to start the school year, and you're all excited about things except that, that one issue that's nagging you. If you're in Christ, that sin is lifted off. And now you can run freely after him, freely following him because of his grace. Or maybe for you it's you're embarrassed by your failings. You don't want your failings to be exposed. You're constantly trying to hide from your brothers and sisters, not really letting them know what's going on. But look, you don't have to do that. Because in God's sight, your sins are covered up. He doesn't expose them. He doesn't embarrass you. The only reason to expose them one to another is so that we can grow in grace. But there is no condemnation for those that are in Christ Jesus. Or maybe you're some, maybe some of you are account majors, or you want to be a lawyer, and you think more in terms of what you owe God. And getting your ledger sheet right. And what does Psalm 32 say? He does not count our iniquity against us. You owe God nothing except gratitude. You're already forgiven. You're already in his good graces simply because you believed in Jesus Christ. But there is one condition for all of this. And that's the end of verse 2. In whose spirit there is no deceit. That we come to God and to one another honestly about our sins, about what we're going through. That we don't try to pretend to be more righteous than we are. That we freely admit that, I mean, I've been walking with Christ for, I don't know, 20 some years, and I continue to struggle with some of the same sins that brought me to Christ in the first place. And I've picked up others along the way. Or at least it seems that way. Why? Well, because I'm a sinner. But it's also because God is continuing to show me not only my need of grace to humble me, but to remind me of his grace to me that continues. So, what does this do for us? How do we respond to this news? So far, we've, we've seen guilt. We've seen God's grace. And now we move to gratitude. That's the movement of the Christian life in that order. Guilt, grace, and gratitude. The gratitude here is found in the third and fourth sections of the psalm, which we'll look at just briefly. Look, uh, in verse 6 and 7, he says, Therefore let everyone who is godly offer prayer to you at a time when you may be found. What does it mean to be godly in this psalm? Well, we've been talking about it. What it means to be godly is to admit you're a sinner who needs grace. That's what it means. Same thing at the end, where it says, Be glad, a righteous, and be upright. Those who are righteous are those that are righteous in Christ. They're upright by faith. But there is a warning here that, that you should pray uh, while God may be found. And, and we don't have time to get into this so much, but the point is if God is speaking to you this morning, don't wait until next week to repent. Don't wait until the end of the semester. Some of you are maybe even coming here saying, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to have fun this semester in a sinful way, and then I'll get back to God later. You don't know what kind of damage you may cause. And if you are Christ, he will not let you slip into hell but you will feel this verse 3 and 4 come into your life now. God is speaking to you now. Repent now. Come back to God now. Ask for more of God's love in your life now, today, while he may be found. And then look at what God will do for you. Surely in the rush of great waters, they, those shall not reach you. This is sort of what we sang earlier. You are a hiding place for me. You reserve me from trouble. You sur surround me with shouts of deliverance. We sang earlier about Jesus, lover of my soul. Let me to thy bosom fly while the nearer waters full. Hide me, O my Savior, hide. And then God surrounds us with shouts of deliverance. And many people think this means that David's with other sinners, saved by grace, all surrounded together. And so look, look out at one another. 
How do you see one another? Do you see each other primarily by the sins and the faults? And you're looking around and saying, well, I don't know that guy very well. But I'm talking about the people you know. Your family members. Do you identify them by their feelings? Or do you see them as forgiven sinners like you? Do you see them lifted up in Christ, even as God looks at you? And then we come to these just verses 8 and 9, just very briefly. This strange section where the, the voice changes and scholars are divided exactly in half. Who's speaking here? Half the commentators say, well, this is God speaking to David. And then David's just recounting what God said. Others say, no, this is now David turning and speaking to the congregation that's surrounding him. But the point is this, that where David is saying, I'm going to teach you from my experience as a forgiven sinner. I'm looking you in the eye. But the point is this. Don't be like a horse or a mule. God is sovereign. God can control you. God can make you godly by force, if you will. But that's not what he wants us to be. He wants us to be those whose hearts are transformed by gratitude, who want to follow after him. Right? Now, again, if you're in Christ, and you choose to actively rebel, if you're really in Christ, you're not going to end up in hell. But what God's going to do is he's going to put that bit and bridle on you, and he's going to drag you back. I mean, and, and if you have a leash on you, and it's been dragged, I mean, I, I don't think I have, uh, but I have a dog, and I can tell she doesn't always enjoy it. And she get, That's because God loves you. That's what he's going to do. Do you want to be that way? Where God's just yanking you back into obedience? No. You're already forgiven in Christ. Now live that way. Freely follow after him. Make this a semester of free repentance of freely coming to God and, and, and seeing the depths of your sin. Don't be scared of it. It's there to, to make you more godly because then look what the end result is. This is not just to make you happy. Look at what verse 10 says. Many of the sorrows of the wicked, but steadfast love surrounds the one who trusts in the Lord. Yes, we know our sin, but this God's love surrounds us, so we're not afraid to face it. Remember our question, are we supposed to be happier or sadder? Well, in one sense we're sadder because we know our sin and we, we hate evil in a way that unbelievers probably don't. But in another sense, we also have the gospel. And that makes us far happier than anyone else on earth. We alone, we who are in Christ alone, are assured of living forever with God in heaven. We alone are assured that God has forgiven us and loves us. And we know this because of Christ's own blood, which purchases us. Look at what verse 11 then says. Look, oh, you might say, oh, I didn't come to church to hear about sin. Like, well, find another church. But, <laughs> but, but this is not where we want to end. We want to end with verse 11. I mean, David's just talked about how miserable he was in his sin, but look how he ends. Be glad in the Lord. Rejoice, O righteous. Shout for joy, all you upright in heart. He begins the psalm by saying, I was silent, but he ends by shouting. Do you see that? And so one last point out there to you Presbyterians. <laughs> David says we are to be glad, we are to rejoice, and we are to shout. And some of you are thinking, thank you. And some of you are thinking, oh no, I'm shouting in my heart. <laughs> no. Are you going to go to any football games this fall? <laughs> Are you going to shout in your heart when they play in the Sandman? <laughs> when they score a touchdown? I'm a big soccer fan. I enjoyed uh, cheering with Chip last year when he taught me the new cheer. I believe that we can, I didn't even know that cheer uh, until he taught it. He got the whole crowd going. Uh, I mean, I, I'm such a big fan, I actually made a soccer hat out of an old soccer ball. <laughs> and I donated it to some campus outreach students on the promise that they wear it every game. You can actually see it kind of down in the corner of President Sands' tweets about the game Friday night. If you look really carefully, I'm going to shout and cheer at soccer games. Why do those excite me more than the grace of God? Remember the movement of the song from one of silence because we're ashamed and embarrassed and we've just been stuffing down our stuff with God. But then when we own our sin, that leads us to shouting about his grace. Now, if I were to ask each of you to shout on the basis of your righteousness, if I were to say, all of you measure your good works, and on that basis, shout out how good you think you are, there would be a lot of mumbling. 
And if we're honest, there ought to be complete silence, right? If I were to say, everyone rejoice because you're such great. Everyone celebrate yourselves. That's what the world does. But we have something far better to celebrate. Something far surer. We shout because of the sure grace of God. What if I were to tell you, shout and rejoice and be glad because of what God has done for you in Christ? How many yeah. would remain silent? Yeah. That's pretty good for Christmas here. <laughs> But what we will do is we will shout and we sing. That's what we do. That's what the scriptures tell us to do. Is we sing with our hearts. We sing with vigor. We sing with joy. And we leave having heard about our sin, but even more having heard about the grace of God. And so are we happy or are we sad? We're both. Because we're, we're becoming more fully human by the work of God within us. As he first humbles us by our sin, but then he insults us in our God and Father, we do thank you for your word. We thank you, Lord, that your word helps us to be honest with who we are. And yet it does not leave us there in our mock and sorrow, but then turns us to your grace. And so we would first, Lord, each now take some time, beginning this new school year, confessing our our sins, or the ones that we keep hanging on to, we would no longer be silent about them, but now quietly, physically, but, but out loud in our hearts to you, we would turn to you now, confessing our sins. Hear us, O Lord, as we each pray. Oh, Lord, what shall we do with these? We keep struggling year in and year out. We shall bring them to the foot of the cross once more and know that we are forgiven, that you cover these up, and that you do not count them against us. Oh, what great grace. And so hear us once more now as we pray and sing to you with great gladness and grace. In Christ's name.